These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is The Telephone Game, written by Georgia Cook and narrated by James Barnett, a.k.a. Jimmy Horace. We were gathered around the phone booth, Gordon, Mandy and me, stuffing our hands into our mouths to stifle nervous giggles as Ryan dialed the number. We'd all dared one another to do it, but he'd drawn the short straw. It was the summer holidays. The world outside smelt of endless heat and cut lawns. Inside the booth, the air was close and damp. Go on, hissed Gordon. You've got to dial it correctly. Gordon's brother had told him about the number, which naturally made him the authority on today's events. Ryan's hands shook as he dialed. We watched owlishly as he plugged in the final digit, then held the receiver out for us to listen. For a long moment, there was only static hissing down the line. Then, as if from far away, I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Help me. I'm drowning. A little girl's voice, soft and monotone, which only made her repeated plea all the creepier. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Help me. I'm drowning. We listened, enraptured, until Mandy let out a delighted shriek and scrambled from the booth. We all followed suit, bolting through the doors as fast as our legs could carry us. See? gasped Gordon as we ran. I told you. I told you it's real. It was real. The telephone game, it was called. A haunted phone number. Gordon's brother had sworn blind that a friend had called it from a phone booth two villages over and heard the voice of a dead girl crackling down the line. Now we'd heard it too. It was two days later. My parents had gone out for the evening, leaving my brother Tim in charge. Tim had left half an hour later, giving me strict instructions not to snitch. I was on my own in my room reading a comic, when a sound echoed through the empty house. The hallway phone was ringing. I padded downstairs. This was back when houses only had one landline phone, and mobile devices were unheard of. I'd been told to answer any calls, take a message and number if it was for my parents, and put it down if it was a cold caller. I picked up, ready to field any questions about Tim's whereabouts if necessary. Hello? A hiss of static on the other end. Then a little girl's voice whispered down the line. My neck prickled. It was a good likeness of the voice from the phone booth. Very funny, Mandy, I said. You don't scare me. Another static buzz. Then the voice came again. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Help me. I'm drowning. Mandy, come on. I tried to sound unconcerned, but I'd grown uncomfortably aware of the hallway shadows, sucking at my ankles filled with grinning teeth and watching eyes. With the childhood certainty that horrors live just out of sight of adult awareness, I'd had enough. I slammed down the phone and bolted back to my room. I slept with the light on that night, and not a wink until my parents arrived home. That was a mean trick, I said. What trick? Mandy asked. We were sitting in Ryan's treehouse the following morning, feet dangling from the open doorway. Last night, I said. With the phone. Didn't scare me one bit, though. Mandy's expression of bewilderment didn't budge. Oh, come on, I insisted. Guys, I'm not a baby. It didn't work. They all stared at me. We didn't phone you last night, said Gordon. Honest, Davy. Yeah, Ryan nodded. Honest. I sat back, watching them with carefully guarded suspicion. It wasn't unlike them to pull a prank like that, but their expressions of earnest confusion were good, even for us. I still wasn't fooled, I told myself. Not in the slightest. The 
phone rang again that night. I lay in bed, waiting for my father's footsteps to leave the bedroom, waiting for the click as he picked up the phone, then the thud 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 as he climbed the stairs. Nobody got up to answer it. I lay in the dark, listening to the sharp incessant ringing from below, but my parents' room lay silent and still. The phone rang until the sky began to lighten. Long past the time it should have clicked into voicemail. Then, with a terrible finality that almost felt intentional, it stopped. When I asked my parents about it the next morning, they looked as bewildered as my friends had. Tim looked like I'd grown a second, even more embarrassing head. I realised nobody else had heard the call. Nobody at all. What are you doing, champ? Tim was staring at me over the top of the banister. I'd been standing in the hall, watching the phone so intently that I hadn't heard him arrive. I'd been waiting for it to ring, paralysed by fear of what I'd do when it did. I almost told Tim to buzz off and mind his own business. Then it occurred to me that he was a friend of Frank's. I knew all sorts of stuff that seemed strange and alien to my ten-year-old brain. I shot him a look. You ever played the telephone game? I asked. Tim's eyebrows rose. The telephone game? He asked. Where'd you hear about that? Gordon told me. Ah, Tim grinned. Right. I looked away, embarrassed by how easily Tim made me feel like a baby. Forget about it, I muttered. It's nothing. Something in my tone must have nudged him because Tim crossed his arms and leaned against the banister. Yeah, I've heard about it, he said. Just some regional testing thing. Like for the phone companies. It's not actually a haunted phone number. But what if it is? I insisted. What if, you know? Tim regarded me carefully, like a scientist divulging a well-guarded secret. Well... You have to do it properly, he said. Properly? Tim nodded. There's a ritual to it. You can't just call a number willy-nilly and expect the same result. Looking back, I realise now that he didn't really believe me. He was just trying to appease his little brother, so he could get back to being five years older and infinitely more world-weary. What do I do? I asked. Well, Tim considered this a moment. It only works at night, for a start. I pictured the path across the village, the phone booth rising from the darkness like a rotten tooth, edged in silver moonlight. Then what? I whispered. Another thoughtful pause. You know what they say about the girl on the end of the line, don't you? Said Tim. I shook my head. You've got to agree to help her. Why? Tim was getting into it now. Because she's drowning, bozo. You can't just leave her hanging. She'll think you're one of them. One of what? I hated myself for being so easily sucked into my brother's game. One of her murderers. Tim groaned theatrically, wriggling his fingers. Then he leaned forward and flicked me on the nose, laughed, and hurried back upstairs. I stood for a while in the empty hall, staring at the phone. I thought about the girl, lost in a sea of roiling airwaves grasping blindly for someone, anyone to save her. David! My father shouted from the hall. I'd been sitting in my room staring at a comic, trying to ignore the phone ringing down below. With a twinge of guilt, I abandoned my comic and shuffled onto the landing. My father held out the phone as I descended the stairs. It's for you. Reluctantly, I took the receiver and held it to my ear. Hello? Hello? It was Mandy. I hate you. She snapped. And I never want to speak to you again. I was so shocked I almost forgot my unease. What? What did I do? I know it was you. Calling us all up in the middle of the night. Gordon says he's going to break your nose if you do it again. And I hope he does. Calling you? I haven't. I paused. A strange kind of relief gripped my chest. Wait. You mean... The phone calls. She'd had them too. The others had heard it. I wasn't the only one. In a rush, I told Mandy what Tim had told me about the telephone game. How we'd done it wrong the first time. What the little girl needed from us. Mandy was quiet after I finished. 
You're telling the truth. She asked. I'll never forget how small and scared she sounded. I swore I was. Then, with a surge of daring, I told her to tell the others. I told her we'd meet tonight in the phone booth. We'd ring the number and offer to help the drowning girl. We'd fix this. None of us wanted another call. It was past midnight when I left the house. Nothing stirred from upstairs as I eased open the front door, careful not to make a sound, then hurried away down the garden path. We met on the street corner and made our way solemnly towards the phone box at the end of the village. A summer thickness hung in the air, giving texture to the darkness. None of us had dared bring a light. Just as we had before, we crammed into the booth together. Someone shut the door. I don't know who. And just like that, we were inside, the night pressing in around us like the depths of the pitch black sea. The others all looked at me, and I realized I'd been nominated de facto leader of this little excursion. Slowly, I dialed the number, put the receiver to my ear, and listened. The familiar crackle of static flooded the line, then over the top, muffled, as if from far away, came the monotone voice. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Help me. I'm drowning. Hello? I tried. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Help me. I'm drowning. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Look, I just want... I'm drowning. I steeled myself. Where are you? I managed, trying to raise my voice above a whisper. Where are you? We'll... We'll, we'll come rescue you. There was another silence on the other end, and I swear that silence was more unnerving than any plea. Then Ryan let out a shriek. I turned. A thin layer of water covered the phone booth floor. It had been dry as a bone when we first climbed in. As I watched, it rose a centimetre, seemingly without anything feeding it. The sharp shock of it seeped through my shoes, prickling my socks. We all stared at one another. Then, the door, Gordon gasped. Mandy grabbed the handle and pushed, but nothing happened. Together, she and Gordon threw themselves against it. It still wouldn't budge. We were trapped. The water rose higher, biting our ankles, then thighs. Ryan pressed against the wall, wide-eyed with terror. Mandy and Gordon pounded on the door, screaming for help. What did you do? Ryan whimpered. What did you do? I opened my mouth to reply, to scream or yell or burst into tears, but something grabbed my ankle. I looked down. The floor had vanished completely now, leaving a churning abyss of water. A thin grey hand had risen from the depths and wrapped around my leg, the nails sharp, the skin peeling away to reveal bleach white bone. Something was pulling itself up, up out of the water towards us. The phone static rose to a scream. Realising I was still holding the receiver, I closed my eyes and slammed it back down on the hook. Silence fell. When I opened my eyes, the water had vanished. No churning abyss. No ghostly hands rising from the depths. Just my sodden trainers and the wide-eyed horror of my friends. Nobody said a word. Not a thing. When we returned to the street corner, we made a promise not to tell anyone what we'd seen or done. Then we went our separate ways for home. When no new calls arrived the next day, or the next... A weight seemed to lift from my shoulders. I saw it in the faces of the others too. By the time school started again in September, we'd almost forgotten that terrifying week in the middle of summer, when a drowning girl had called us from beyond the grave. We'd beaten it. We'd won. Ryan drowned in 88. A swimming accident in our final year of college. Gordon's boat capsized on a university sailing trip out of the Cornish coast. That was after we'd all gone our separate ways, but I read about it in the newspaper. 
I can't bring myself to check on Mandy. Sometimes I think about looking her up online, but I never do. I don't dare go out in the rain. I avoid pools and puddles and even mentions of the sea. The house is dark. I pick up the phone. There's no dialing tone, just distant static. Then a voice, monotone and unwavering, echoes softly down the line. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Help me. Help me. Help me. She's getting louder. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. The Telephone Game was written by Georgia Cook, narrated and produced by James Barnett, a.k.a. Jimmy Horace himself, with music by Tim Kulig and Ocular Sounds and UM Corps and Tom Robson. The sound effect provided by freesound.org and Ocular Sounds. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Joshua Boucher for helping with our submission reading. And of course to Ben Errington, the guardian of digital traditions. His content rituals honouring the ancient rites of storytelling and community building, preserving those sacred bonds and rituals that connect us all in the online world. Georgia Cook is an illustrator and writer from London. She's written for publications such as Baffling, Asterian Lit and Flame Tree Press, as well as the Doctor Who range with Big Finish. She can be found on Twitter at, at Georgia Cooked and on her website georgiacookwriter.com. You can now also pre-order George's Dracula Daily Sketchbook Collection, which is an art book featuring a new drawing for every entry in the classic horror novel, Dracula. The link for that is a little bit long, so I'll place it in the show notes. James Barnett, aka Jimmy Horrors, is the producer of the Night's End podcast and After the Gloaming. You can search for them wherever you get your podcasts. You can catch other works of his at jamesbarnettcreative.com. Jimmy Stories is a production of the story studio Hawk and Cleaver, and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means share the hell out of it. So, until next time.